Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of William Taft, and the focus is President Taft, whether he wants it or not. But the year is 1908. It is an election year, and a lot of eyes are still on the incumbent Theodore Roosevelt. They want him to run again, but he had said four years before he would not seek another nomination, and so people were wanting to know. Who's your handpicked successor so we can continue the Roosevelt agenda going forward? Well, he had two people in mind, both in his cabinet. According to Roosevelt, I would rather see Elihu Root in the White House than any other man and would walk on my hands and knees from the White House to the Capitol to see Root made president. But I know it cannot be done. Wild horses couldn't drag him into making a public campaign. So if the Secretary of State is out, that left the Secretary of War, William Taft. Now, Taft didn't really want this, but his wife is pushing, his president is pushing. And look, when he had signaled a couple of years before, when he turned down Roosevelt's offer for the Supreme Court, then he pretty much said if the presidency was coming his way, he would be willing to pursue it. And that's what was going to happen here in 1908. So Roosevelt finally came off to really kick off the campaign with his endorsement in January of that year when he said, I believe with all my soul, Taft, far more than any other public man of prominence, represents the principles for which I stand. And I should hold myself false to my duty if I sat supine and let the men who have taken such joy in my refusal to run again select some candidate whose success would mean the undoing of what I have sought to achieve. This is an endorsement of Will Taft for president, in which case Roosevelt used the word I five times. This was really about trying to find someone who would continue his presidency and that Taft was being selected as the man to do that. Well, Will Taft had only run for office once before in his entire career, and that was 20 years before when he ran for his own full term as a judge on the Superior Court in the state of Ohio. Now he's running for president of the United States. He's being asked to campaign, which is something he didn't like to do, he wasn't very good at. Roosevelt is pushing him to be more aggressive, and throughout this whole time, Taft is simply reluctant. When the Republicans finally gathered in convention in Chicago that June, what did Taft say about the whole thing? I'd rather not say what I think of the happenings in Chicago, according to Taft. Besides, I am the least man interested. Well, one person who was very interested was his bride, Nellie Taft. For Nellie Taft, this was the dream. Her husband president, she would be first lady, and she was not happy. She was animated at what was going on in Chicago as she's monitoring things in Washington, D.C., because this convention is all about Roosevelt. His name is mentioned. What did he get? A 49-minute ovation. Nellie Taft was counting the minutes, and she was seething over this. This was supposed to be about her husband, and she was nervous that Roosevelt, at the last minute, was going to change his mind and actually run for the office and take it away from her husband. She could be relieved. He did not do that. First ballot nominee for Taft, 702 votes. Philander Knox way in second place with only 68 kind of a coronation of Roosevelt's handpicked successor for the nomination. The New Yorkers wanted in on the game. They pushed pretty hard to get the VP candidate. And for that, it was Congressman John Sherman who was nominated on the first ballot. So Taft resigned as Secretary of War so he could run for president now officially. What did he do? He went on vacation. He went to the homestead in Hot Springs, Virginia to watch what the Democrats were going to do. And the Democrats came up with William Jennings Bryan, who was running for now the third time in the last four races. Bryan went after Roosevelt and his administration, with Taft sort of being a proxy for that. Bryan, a very aggressive orator, and frankly, Roosevelt was pushing Taft to fight back. He told Taft, do not answer Bryan, attack him. Don't let him make the issues. He continued later, prize fights are won by knocking out the other man when he is groggy. But that was Roosevelt's way. It was certainly not Taft's way. And he said, look, that's just not going to be me. I am sorry, but I cannot be more aggressive than my nature makes me, Taft said. This is the advantage and disadvantage of having been on the bench. I can't call names and I can't use adjectives when I don't think the case calls for them, so you'll have to get along with that kind of a candidate. And if the people don't like that kind of a man, they have to find them, maybe go get another. But of course, there was no other. He was already the nominee. This was going to be the best they were going to get. Well, in the end, none of this really mattered. Roosevelt was popular. His handpicked successor was going to be popular. Taft won this race easily. Electoral college count 321 to 162. 
popular vote. He won by over a million votes, about 1.2 million. Other than, other than Roosevelt, it's really kind of the best anybody had done in the last four or five decades. So it was a big success. Roosevelt is thrilled. Nellie Taft is thrilled. And Will Taft is at least content. He's going to be president, and he wanted to say thanks. Thanks to Theodore Roosevelt. He wrote in the letter, the first letter that I wish to write is to you because you have always been the chief agent in working out the present state of affairs, and my selection and election are chiefly your work. You and my brother Charlie made that possible, which in all probability would not have occurred otherwise. Pretty innocuous little nice thank you note. Not so to Theodore Roosevelt. Him and his brother Charlie? What did Charlie do? That's what Theodore Roosevelt is telling other people. Why would he get some credit? Of course, Charlie was involved in the campaign, raised money, did a lot of organizing. But look, Roosevelt, kind of right, it was him that pushed Taft in there. But Roosevelt was offended by this. That's the point. That rift that would grow between Roosevelt and Taft, a lot of people think it started with this rather innocuous thank you letter where Roosevelt wasn't getting all the credit. What do new president-elects do? Well, they have to pick a cabinet. They have to put inaugural address together. So what did Taft do? He picked up golf. He started playing golf every day. He went to Augusta, Georgia, started loving the game. But what he really seemed to like about golf is that people left him alone when he was on the golf course. That would be a trend that he would take into the presidency. As for the cabinet, well, Taft initially had told Roosevelt that he was going to be willing to keep a lot of Roosevelt's people. It had been his peers when he had served in, Ta- in Roosevelt's cabinet. But then he started to backtrack. He realized in his mind that Roosevelt's cabinet was really built around policy, being the aggressive executive branch policy drivers. For Taft, he saw his presidency as taking Roosevelt's ideas, but really codifying them into law, not as much the bully pulpit of the executive branch. So Taft wanted, as his advisors, lawyers, kind of like himself, people who understood the law. So he started making some changes, and the progressive followers of Roosevelt were not happy, particularly over the uh, uh, departure of James Garfield, the son of the former president who had been the Secretary of Interior. He was a strong conservationist. It was really close to Roosevelt. He was let go by Taft, put in favor of Richard Ballinger, an attorney from Seattle, who he thought could actually run this again, get that stuff into law. But the progressives were really worried about this change in particular. Was this a sign that Taft was going to backtrack from the Roosevelt agenda? Inauguration Day is March 4th, and a blizzard showed up in Washington, D.C., a rather ominous sign. They actually had to move the ceremonies indoors into the Senate chamber where Taft took his oath. He gave his inaugural address, which was rather a pedestrian speech. It was more like an annual message, kind of a long list of policy areas that he planned to continue. Not a lot of exciting oratory, but again, that's sort of the nature of Taft. The bottom line from Taft is, look, I'm going to try to continue Roosevelt's agenda. I'm not Roosevelt. I'm going to focus more on getting things instantiated in law. I'm more conservative than him, but don't worry. I'm going to push forward with the Roosevelt agenda. People were already not so sure, including Roosevelt. On this day, he was quoted as saying, Taft's all right. He means well and he'll do his best, but he's weak. They'll get around him. Again, that rift just starting. But to Roosevelt's credit, he did the right thing. He got out of Washington. He got out of the United States. He was going to let Taft have his own time. He went to Africa for an adventure, for a safari. He was going to be gone for about a year. And so this would give Taft some time to get his own footing, although that Rooseveltian cloud continued to kind of hang over the administration. Well, by Roosevelt leaving immediately from the Capitol, he didn't even go back to the White House with Taft. This created an opening, an opening for Nellie Taft to do something that no woman, no first lady had ever done before. Ride back to the White House with her husband, whether it had been in a carriage or now in an automobile. No wife had ever done that after being sworn in. And Nellie Taft was pretty thrilled by this. She said, for me, that drive was the proudest and happiest event in Inauguration Day. Perhaps I had a little secret elation in thinking I was doing something which no woman had ever done before. This was in many ways her day, her dream finally coming true. Now, there was another familiar face that was going to be part of Taft's inner circle, nobody more inner than Nellie Taft, but next was Captain Archibald Butt, his military aide. He had gotten to know Butt in the Philippines when he had served kind of his social calendar and responsible for 
but had then gone to Cuba, did some service there before coming to Washington, where he served as Roosevelt's military aide. Archie Butt loved Roosevelt. He loved Will Taft. He was happy to stick around for the next uh, term in office. We know a lot about the Taft administration on the personal side from letters that Archie Butt wrote, but this was going to be a tough four years. As Taft and Roosevelt started to split, Archie Butt felt very much caught in the middle of that. The happiest of all, of course, in all of this was Nellie Taft. Again, this was her dream, and she jumped in right away, running the White House, not only the social events, but also the management of the White House. She was going to be less involved in her husband's business than really she had ever had before, because now she had the job she wanted, First Lady of the United States, and that had a lot of responsibilities. One of the first things she did was to replace the long-term male steward who ran the White House with a woman, a housekeeper, Elizabeth Jaffrey, who was a bit of abrasive and kind of a turnoff to the staff at times, but Nellie Taft liked her and a lot of presidents liked her. She actually stayed through the next three presidents. Nellie Taft and Jaffrey oversaw the completion of the West Wing, which had been started under the Roosevelts, and also the completion of the Oval Office. Will Taft, the first one to occupy the Oval Office, redecorating on the uh, family side of the quarters in the Asian flavor, very much a homage to the Philippines that uh, Nellie Taft had liked so much. And she even had mentioned how much she liked the Japanese cherry trees. Well, when the mayor of Tokyo found out about that, he said, look, Here's a goodwill gesture. I'm sending the new president of the United States and his bride 2,000 of these cherry trees. Do what you want with them. And Nellie Taft had them planted around the Tidal Basin near the National Mall. And she wondered at the time that, I wonder if any of them will ever attain the magnificent growth of the ancient and dearly loved cherry trees of Japan. Well, she could rest peacefully on this note because millions would enjoy those cherry trees as part of the National Cherry Blossom Festival that would go on, of course, uh, ever since Nellie Taft had those uh, trees that were that were planted around the Tidal Basin. Now, there was a setback, though, early in Taft's term for Nellie Taft. The Taft family, they were on a cruise on the presidential yacht on the Potomac River down near George Washington's home near Mount Vernon when something happened. And Will Taft captured it in a note to his son, Robert, that Nellie Taft had suffered a very severe nervous attack in which she lost all muscular control of her right arm and her right leg and of the vocal cords and the muscles governing her speech. This was a stroke. It was serious. Nellie Taft, over the next three months, serious recuperation in which her husband kind of pushed off a lot of the responsibilities of the presidency to focus on her health. His goal was to make everything happy, all smiles in her sick room. He would hold her hand. He would help her speech word by word. Her four sisters all came in to help out in terms of managing the first lady's responsibilities. After about three months, Nellie Taft started to come around. It would take about a year, though, before she was back to full strength and back to fully enjoying her time as First Lady of the United States. So this was one of the scares for Taft in his first year. He had plenty of scares in his first year. That a lot also had to do with politics, and those are stories for another day. That is Will Taft and President Taft, whether he wants it or not, from the life of William Taft. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.